Good day everyone, Doc Mika here, and for this lecture video, we will be discussing modules 5 and 6, starting with the determinants of viral disease. So out of all the topics that we have discussed already, uh, like cell, organ, and tissue tropism, um, the different cytopathic effects of the viruses, what are the different factors which determine how um, a viral disease happens and how mild, moderate, or severe it can be. And also, what determines um, the ultimate uh, outcome of the virus-host interaction. All right, let's begin with uh, a few terminologies. All right. So pathogenicity, virulence, resistance, and susceptibility. I believe you have, uh, you're familiar with all these words already. Um, they're, not, uh, they're not new to you, so I'm going to go at this really fast. I just wanted you to, um, to remember them. All right. So pathogenicity, we say that it is the ability of a virus, in this case, to cause disease in an infected host. We have repeated time and time again that infection does not equate to clinical disease. And when you go back to our previous lecture videos, you will find out the details for that. Virulence is the measure of pathogenicity. While a resistance, when we talk about a host resistance, that is the ability to resist infection. When we talk about viral resistance, that is uh, the ability of the virus to resist um, being destroyed by external stimuli, by certain uh, pH changes or different um, environmental changes. Right? And susceptibility would be the flip side of that, which is the ability of the host to suffer from infection or how vulnerable it is to um, microorganisms that cause infection. And uh, these words must not be equated to transmission, okay? It doesn't mean that a very virulent virus will be easily transmitted as well and vice versa, all right? So um, this picture just shows you that a more virulent virus will um, lead to clinical disease even more than a less virulent uh, virus, which would render you pretty much sick. So you uh, will not be able to transmit that virus to more people because you're not out and about doing normal stuff. As compared to um, uh, a less virulent virus, wherein it could have been causing mild infections, which is not rendering you um, sick and unable to do things, but it actually um, permits you to go out and that and there is a higher chance of transmission of such a virus. All right. So what are the determinants of virulence when we talk about viruses, Muna? All right. The first thing would be the genetic makeup of the virus. When we talked about the viral morphology, the... Um, the, the characteristics of viruses, of what kind of receptors it, ha uh, it has, um, the kind of receptors it's looking for, these all contribute to how pathogenic and if it is non-pathogenic in animal species, all right? So all these genetic makeup, the entire nucleic acid sequence each virus would have, which would code for the proteins which will be expressed um, in its capsid or in its envelope, which would have antigenic properties, would be the one saying or deciding if that specific variant is pathogenic or not and how pathogenic it can be. Let's take um, the basic example of how genetic makeup um, determines the virulence. The example would be the influenza virus, all right? So there are pathogenic and non-pathogenic strains of the virus um, which have different genetic sequences, which causes morphological changes in the variant as well. And 
um, these changes in the genetic sequences, right? Oh, I just said that. Um, changes the virulence of the virus, right? The outstanding feature of influenza viruses would be the genetic variability or yung pagkakaiba-iba ng envelope glycoprotein nila, which are the two, um, the main proteins of influenza viruses. The hemagglutinin protein and the neuraminidase protein, which could undergo changes known as the antigenic drift and the antigenic shift, right? So uh, looking at this image, as you can see from 1918, the Spanish influenza up to the 1957 H2N2, the H3N2 uh, influenza, them the difference would be in the glycoprotein in the envelope. All right, and that could um, that could change into um, by two methods. All right, that would be antigenic drift or antigenic shift. Let's discuss that in more detail. All right, antigenic drift versus antigenic shift. I'm not sure if you have discussed this in uh, other subjects like uh, immunology, but we'll um, reprise this for um, for a virological uh, context. Right. Antigenic drift um, is this is what happens when there are small changes um, in the nucleic acid se uh, sequence. And when we discussed this before, we called uh, these small changes as mutations. And any change in the nucleic acid sequence can change the morphological characteristic of the virus. And in this case, it changes the surface proteins of the virus. Like, for example, in this picture, virus A, um, it accumulates mutations over time. The shapes of those surface proteins can change, all right? From a, sorry, from a triangular shape of the surface protein, it can be a cuboidal or a rectangular one after antigenic drift happens, all right? And since these are small changes, the resultant viruses are pretty much similar to each other that if you, uh, they will fall under the same branch of the phylogenetical three, uh, tree, sorry. So they share the same antigenic properties, okay? Or what we call cross protection. So this is why um, we see a lot of variations of influenza viruses every year, right? There's another influenza virus um, from last year to this year, uh, there's another strain, there's another subtype because of this antigenic drift, right? However, the small changes associated with antigenic drift can accumulate over time and result um, to another virus which is antigen antigenically different, right? Meaning the antibodies that used to work for virus A would not work anymore for virus B. Right, so this actually leads to host reinfection, which is very common for those patients who had influenza last year only to find themselves getting reinfected this year. All right, the body's immune system may not recognize and prevent sickness caused by the newer influenza viruses. Right, so the person becomes susceptible again to flu infection, and um. This is the main reason why people can get the flu more than one time. And this is why the flu vaccine composition must be reviewed and updated each year or as needed to keep up with the evolving influenza viruses. Right? In antigenic shift, on the other hand, this would be an abrupt major change resulting in a new hemagglutinin protein or new hemagglutinin and neuraminidase proteins, right? So look at this uh, image, right? When there is this major change or what we call reassortment, we're in two viruses of different types, right? Uh, infect the same um, host and they can get into the same cell and start the process of virus replication the genetic sequences of each one can intermix with each other result, resulting to a new virus subtype right 
This happens when a, spe a species-specific virus, for example, virus A can only infect pigs, um, gains the ability to infect another species, for example, humans, right? This, um, this phenomenon, though, occurs very rarely as compared to the drift, right? This is why when this happens, this rare antigenic shift happens, the progeny viruses have pandemic potential, right? Because it's entirely new, whatever your immune system was used to fighting, which may be... Um, which may share the same antigenic properties, this is a very new virus in this case, all right? So, uh, for example, in the 2009 swine flu, when the H1N1 virus um, happened, the, when they uh, assessed or when they um, studied the genetic sequences of the H1N1 virus of 2009, they saw that it contained genes from the virus that infected swine, humans, and birds, and gained the ability to infect people and quickly spread. So most people would have little or no immunity against the new virus. And uh, when that happens, that causes your pandemic um, diseases, right? So uh, in influenza viruses, type A viruses undergo both drift and shift, and they are the only viruses known to cause pandemics, while the influenza type B would usually just go through their gradual process of antigenic drift. This is also um, related to the other genetic determinant, which would be the process of reassortment. The reassortment of genes during replication can happen in any virus. It's just that it mostly happens with the influenza viruses because of the main um, uh, morphological, sorry, um, genetic characteristic of influenza being a single-stranded, uh, negative-strand, segmented RNA, right? So before, um, when reassortment happens, before it could actually result to a new virus subtype, right? Whenever they mix inside, they have to fulfill certain criteria, right? So the two viruses that will need to intermix with each other, um, they are of different genotypes, but they must be able to infect the same host and the same tissue, and they can enter the same cell at the same time, right? That means they must... Uh, be looking for the same cell receptor, right? The co-infecting genomes inside must mix within the infected cell, meaning you have two viruses competing for the cellular machinery of one infected cell and for it to be, uh, to start replicating, right? So that, that is why this, this process rarely happens because it's just a matter of the right timing and at the right time for these replicated segments to join together and be packaged together, right? So the, the success of uh, reassortant uh, progeny viruses depends on uh, the compatibility of the reassortant genes and, of course, the host environment. Is it uh, conducive for the replication of these two viruses, which are of different genotypes? Um, also, um, is there a competition with the parent viruses present in the same host, right? So this is a picture, uh, video of um, that process. Let's watch this together. So this antigenic drift is what causes the new seasonal strain every year that requires a new seasonal vaccine. But this is different from antigenic shift. And shift is where the influenza genome being segmented comes into play. So how does antigenic shift occur? Well, normally when a cell is infected with the flu, eight gene segments come in, are copied, and then the same eight segments are packaged into a new viral particle. But if a single cell, whether it's animal or human or whatever, is infected with two different influenza viruses, the two viruses can actually exchange RNA gene segments that leads to the creation of a third virus that's different from both of the parent viruses. And this exchange of genes is called reassortment. 
You might have noticed that people refer to influenza in a funny way. Sometimes they'll say H1N1 or H3N2. Well, that means the flu strain has a certain hemagglutinin protein and a certain neuraminidase protein. So with reassortment, to give you an example, if one cell is infected with both H1N1 and H3N2 influenza, you could theoretically produce a new H3N1 influenza strain. So antigenic shift can result in pandemics, which are a global spread of a new and totally different influenza strain to which the population has little to no immunity, and so it can spread very easily from human to human. But one thing that's interesting is that this antigenic shift only happens with influenza A and not B. So why is that? The reason it turns out is that influenza A can infect animals, all kinds including birds, pigs, horses, and more. And what does that have to do with it? Well, when viruses infect other species, they adapt to those species, and that gives them a lot more genetic diversity. So when reassortment happens, including these non-human strains, it can produce new viruses that by chance are infectious to humans, but are very different from what humans are used to seeing because the building blocks came from animals. And as an example, do you remember the swine flu? So that was the most recent pandemic in 2009, and that was a reassortment of avian, swine, and human viruses. And that reassortment event that we talked about happened in a pig, and that's why it was called swine flu. And that could never have happened with influenza B, which does not infect animals. So this antigenic so this drift is what causes the new seasonal strain every year that requires a new seasonal vaccine. But this is different from antigenic shift. And shift is where the influenza genome being segmented comes into play. So how does antigenic shift occur? Well, normally when a cell is infected with the flu, eight gene segments come in, are copied, and then the same eight segments are packaged into a new viral particle. But if a single cell, whether it's animal or human or whatever, is infected with two different influenza viruses, the two viruses can actually exchange RNA gene segments that leads to the creation of a third virus that's different from both of the parent viruses. And this exchange of genes is called reassortment. You might have noticed that people refer to influenza in a funny way. Sometimes they'll say, H1N1 or H3N2. Well, that means the flu strain has a certain hemagglutinin protein and a certain neuraminidase protein. So with reassortment, to give you an example, if one cell is infected with both H1N1 and H3N2 influenza, you could theoretically produce a new H3N1 influenza strain. So antigenic shift can result in pandemics, which are a global spread of a new and totally different influenza strain to which the population has little to no immunity and so it can spread very easily from human to human. But one thing that's interesting is that this antigenic shift only happens with influenza A and not B. So why is that? The reason it turns out is that influenza A can infect animals, all kinds including birds, pigs, horses, and more. And what does that have to do with it? Well, when viruses infect other species, they adapt to those species, and that gives them a lot more genetic diversity. So when reassortment happens, including these non-human strains, it can produce new viruses that by chance are infectious to humans, but are very different from what humans are used to seeing because the building blocks came from animals. And as an example, do you remember the swine flu? So that was the most recent pandemic in 2009, and that was a reassortment of avian, swine, and human viruses. And that reassortment event that we talked about happened in a pig, and that's why it was called swine flu. And that could never have happened with influenza B, which does not infect animals. All right, so we have talked about the determinants of viruses. Now we have to talk about what are the determinants of resistance and susceptibility of the host, right? And the first thing would be the cellular receptors. So. Um, the host susceptibility and or resistance would depend on the presence of the appropriate cellular receptor for a particular virus on the cells of key target organs. Again, this is what you call cell tropism. So if um, a virus is um, only looking for receptors which are only expressed by dogs and they um, encounter cats, they will not be able to mount an infection. So example, a uh, human polio virus can only infect primates. Um, they, they found out about these receptors by this way. Uh, when they were introduced inside the cell in vivo, in a uh, research 
um, approach of rodents or mice, they can replicate once. So they can actually hijack the cell that they were put into, but no second replication occurs because the mice um, does not express the receptor that the poliovirus needs to replicate other cells. All right. So you know this already. I keep on repeating this already. All right. Another um, determinant would be immune response genes, right? The responsiveness or how alert your immune system is to antigens are dictated by what we call immune response genes or the IR genes, right? And some animals can develop genetic defects in these genes. They can mutate. They can have a missing um, uh, part of that gene which affects it and which disables them to produce immunoglobulins, right? So example of this would be in Arabian foals, uh, what we call combined immunodeficiency. Uh, there is a, this is an autosomal recessive genetic defect, which causes the development of dysfunctional T cells and B cells. Um, they can either not be activated, they cannot be activated whenever they are presented with antigens, or they cannot produce antibodies, or the antibodies they produce are not working, all right? So um, this is usually uh, detected, one, when there is a failure of passive uh, immunoglobulin transfer from dam to foal using um, the suckling of colostrum, which leads to the foal um, suffering from hypo to agamma globulinemia. Right. So in, in people, in us, it, this also happens. This is what you call the bubble syndrome. When, when a kid is born and it, is, it doesn't have any working immune system. So it, it, I don't know if you watch that movie that's, that's quite old. You know, The Boy in the Bubble. If you watch Grey's Anatomy, there's an episode about that boy in a bubble because it's, the, the T lymphocytes for this kid is non-existent. So any bacteria... Any, any small contamination, even if it's a commensal, which could go into the patient, um, can kill the patient because it does not have um, both a humoral and cell-mediated immunity to fight off any microorganism, right? So interferons, right? Interferons are, as a review, right? Um, these are proteins secreted by those infected cells which uh, they can interfere with the viral replication process and host recovery. They are found to be the first line of defense of the cell against viral infection since these are produced by major cells in the body. Um, it, um, it can also be produced by immune cells, but in large amounts. That would be the macrophage, which produces large amounts of interferon, and they can protect the cells in the immediate vicinity of the initial local infection. Right. So, um, oh, uh, interferon usually what what do they what kind of interferon do macrophages secrete? That will be your alpha and gamma. That that's a review in your immuno. So another um, determinant will be cell differentiation. Right? As you may know, the different stages of the cell, uh, of how it differentiates into its mature um, mode or a setting, can also exert an effect on the reaction to viral infection. For example, right? canine distemper. Right? The virus, uh, the canine distemper virus, does not replicate in resting lymphocytes. Remember, your lymphocytes need to be activated so if they are resting, they will not respond or they will not do their job whenever they encounter the CDV. They need to be, uh, what do you call it? They need to be activated either by an antigen presenting cell, or I forgot the other mode. It's usually just by signaling of the dendritic cell, right? Uh, example two: a canine parvovirus. I'm choosing more <laughs> uh, common viruses this time. Um, this virus can only replicate in cells that are in the S phase of the cell cycle. And S phase would be the synthesis phase. And this is the phase of the cell cycle in which uh, DNA is replicated. And this occurs between G1 and G2. All right. A review again on your cell cycle. So 
um, that would be the immune mechanisms like the, the physiological factors which affect a host's um, uh, what do you call this uh, resistance or susceptibility to infection right sorry about the animation first would be the age right so newborn animals of unexposed dams okay meaning the dam might not have been uh, vaccinated properly or updated um, they did not um, encounter an infection through natural uh, immune uh, through natural infection and they do not have antibodies for that that makes the newborn animals highly susceptible to viruses um, of course the passive immunity passed on by the dam to its litter via the milk or colostrum or um, through transplacental uh, mode can protect the newborn for naturally occurring infection um, except for pigs, cattle, horses, na kailangan ng colostrum for protection. That is why even in calves, if the, because usually we grow uh, cows for dairy, for dairy production, you actually collect the colostrum from the mom and make sure that the calf gets enough colostrum for it to not suffer from, you know, the usual scours. Uh, or that neonatal diarrhea that often affects them, right? Also common for foals and pigs, okay? So another one would be the immune system, of course. Um, the immune system for the young animals are still naive. Um, some of them would still be undergoing developmental um, stages, right? And in old animals, the man, of course, there would be comorbidities or there would be existing medical conditions that could be uh, dampening the immune response or it could be compromising the immune system of the animal All right so um of course when when you're talking about uh like neonates in the farm um and they suffer from this uh you know like scours or diarrhea just going back to that one it doesn't mean immediately that it's viral most commonly it is a uh, has a uh, husbandry management issue or a nutritional one, so you have to to explore all those um, all those possibilities before you rule out that it is uh, infectious in nature. So uh, nutrition, of course, um, deficiencies were found to interfere with generation of antibody and cell mediated immune responses. Um, they uh, deficiencies would also affect the activity of phagocytes. Um, in terms of its phagocytic activity and its production of pro-inflammatory mediators. And of course, um, deficiencies, nutritional, um, would affect the integrity of the skin and the mucous membranes, which act as the uh, mechanical barrier against the entry of viruses, among other, mic uh, other microorganisms. Right? Next. Sex, hormones, pregnancy, stress, and lactation they would um, affect the host, of course, uh, and would affect their capacity to resist or be more vulnerable to any viral infection or viral invasion, right? So for sex, there, of course, sex predilection of viruses would be entirely dependent on the tissue tropism. You would not expect for uh, patients, um, for male patients to suffer from um, disease pathologies which affect female parts like the ovaries and mammary glands and vice versa um, pregnancy would increase the likelihood of disease um, some viruses are reactivated like the herpes virus from the dormant state wherein it's sleeping inside a cell when the host become pregnant um, what else uh, there are some uh, viruses which cause infection and will lead to severe disease of the dam and the baby or the fetus when they get infected by viruses and stress which could be exogenous or endogenous um will lead to immunosuppression all right so overcrowding ammonia toxicity um, whatever um cause of stress there may be and if there are production or if there is a um, call this administration of a steroid to an animal that could actually lead to immunosuppression, which you know already because you're done with pharma or you are studying pharma right now. 
right? Next would be fever, right? We know fever is a normal immune response, right? It is the increase in body temperature as a response uh, to viral infection, mainly mediated by what we call pyrogens. B the basic pyrogen would be your interleukin-1 beta. Some would just stop with interleukin-1. I'll be good with that. Um, interleukin-6 also would contribute to that. Tumor necrosis, necrosis factor, yes, sure. Usually it's just the interleukins. Um, this would the increase in body temperature would not just increase the metabolic activity of phagocytic cells it would also increase the production of antibodies increase uh, or make fast or speed up the t-cell proliferation and a higher temperature is not an ideal temperature for viral replication to occur right so we know fever would be a natural defense against viruses um Call this it would however however it would also profoundly disturb uh, body functions all right so what else do i have to say here let me check my notes all right so there are some uh viruses which are temperature sensitive and they would be they would be expected to be less virulent in such cases whenever there is co-infection or there is secondary infection of other microorganisms so that's important um however some viruses on the other hand evolve the ability to replicate in the hosts that has a fever all right and some viruses when you flip the flip the coin they are actually reactivated by fever this is very much a characteristic of the herpes viruses all right so that is it for module five less than 30 minutes to, uh, counting for module five this is basically it i could add the um these two could actually be mixed with the, the last two videos but then i just decided to cut them into like four modules because I thought I would be spending so much time with them. <laughs> All right, so take a breather, pause the video because I will be going straight into module six. Module six, we are going to discuss the pathogenesis of viral disease, right? The severity of a viral disease is not necessarily correlated with the degree of um, cytopathology produced by the virus in the cell, right? So as if you may remember, if you have watched the video on that, uh, viruses can be cytocidal, they can be non-cytocidal, or they can be transformative to the cell. But it doesn't mean that a cytocidal cell would be more, would be causing a more severe disease, right? Like for example, rabies. Rabies is a non-cytocidal virus. However, it can cause lethal disease in mammals, right? And how, uh, how, um, how bad a viral disease would be would also be dependent on the organ affected, um, degree of cell and tissue damage, which occurs without uh, producing clinical signs, like for example, um, the liver. Okay? If the virus would prefer the liver, it would need to kill and to affect a large number of hepatocytes, specifically around 80%, before you could actually see clinical manifestations pertaining to liver problem. Right? And when, um, when there is damage to the cell, um, you, have, uh, you also have to consider, is, does that cell have a specialized specialized function which um, I could immediately see an effect clinically on the patient like for example you compare a virus that attacks a skeletal muscle it wouldn't be as potentially devastating as organs such as the heart or the brain and moreover lastly um, inflammation and edema caused by viruses are are very significant serious consequences in organs such as the lungs and the central nervous system so it's, it's not just about the cells dying or the cells committing suicide that actually causes disease um, you have to uh, assess 
all these factors that could play into the ultimate uh, clinical manifestation of disease. All right, so we're gonna go into this uh, body system by body system, and the first thing, of course, since this is virology, we know that it is walking hand in hand with immu uh, with immunology because that's the first uh, that's the way we defend our bodies. So it is quite simple that. Um, one of the bad body systems that viruses would affect would be the immune system, right? Since this is the first one which is activated, they're the ones going on that um, war zones to fix the problem, to phagocytize these microorganisms. So they as well sustain damage and get compromised, right? And you can actually see the different... Um, immune responses by the different types right because you have type 1 type 2 type 3 and type 4 right and you have spent a lot of time with uh, discussing these different hypersensitivity reactions in immuno all right so i'm just gonna go over them really fast type 1 would be high, your um your anaphylactic reaction this would be an interaction of the antigen with ige resulting in the release of histamine and heparin in the mast cells. So histamine, excuse me, may give rise to anaphylactic shock that would actually cause your capillary permeability to increase, that will cause inflammation and ultimately distributive shock, right? So type two, um, this is what you call antibody-mediated hypersensitivity or cytotoxicity. Uh, this is cytotoxic reaction mediated by antibodies. What else do I have to say here? Oh, uh, one basic thing is that when they bind to RBCs, they cause lysis and anemia. Okay. The attachment of the viral particles on the surface of the tissue cell would activate the complement system, which leads to cell lysis. Okay. That's all you need to know for type 2. For type 3, which is uh, the Arthas reaction, immune complex mediated reaction, um, this is seen in persistent infections, right? We're in infl inflammation and edema. Um, you add that with infiltration of your uh, polymorphonuclear leukocytes. They are deposited into these areas. We're going to focus on type 3 in the next slide. And this is common for a lot of viruses to go to. Type 4 would be your delay type or uh, cell-mediated one. It involves the T lymphocytes causing inflammation, uh, release of lymphokines, which is um, usually what's used for those um, intradermal tuberculosis tests, right? So let's focus on the one reaction that is specific for viruses. That would be the type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. So, um, type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, we are going to talk about the immune complex. And the immune complex would basically be the antigen and the antibody together, all right? So, when um, the virus, all right, when a virus um, infects a certain cell, it would um, deposit its glycoproteins outside and such, and antibodies could bind into this antigen and all. Now, this forms the antigen-antibody complex, right? And the deposition of these antigen-antibody complex could lead to inflammation and tissue damage. But before that, before that, um, these complexes are usually cleared by tissue macrophages, right? They would circulate, um, they could circulate the body, um, they could actually spread more infection or um, when the ratio of the antibody to antigen is in favor of the antibody, the virus is typically cleared by the tissue macrophages and um, it will not let the virus spread. Right? However, um, in persistent infections wherein the virus has reached primary viremia, seeded into organs, and led to secondary viremia, wherein there is continuous release of variants in the circulatory system, these immune complexes would overwhelm the immune response, um, either because um, there's too much of them, the antibody response is too weak or too slow, 
or the antibodies would still have low affinity to bind to these uh, viruses. So where do the immune complexes go? They are deposited in small blood vessels, which usually function as filters. And what small blood, blood vessels would function as filters? That would be your glomerulus, right? And this deposition process can occur over periods of weeks, months, or years, right? And ultimately, it would lead to the accumulation of these immune complexes and cause inflammation and tissue damage where it is deposited. So that will lead to glomerulonephritis. And this is the basic pathogenesis for certain viruses like the feline leukemia virus, equine anemia virus, the illusion mink virus, and the FIP virus, right? Same process for them all, right? So aside from that, a viruses can also lead to autoimmune diseases. So what do we um, mean by autoimmune diseases? Basically, the immune system would attack normal tissue of the host. It would um, uh, think of it as a foreign, uh, foreign body, foreign antigen that it needs to fight off. Right? And this could happen through a, a variety of mechanisms. Number one uh, is when a virus has tropism for a certain tissue, for example, the central nervous system, it attacks it and it initiates inflammation via the normal pathway. However, this uh, inflammation can actually trigger cells to present itself antigens. Right? The, um, the immune system would have a very high tolerance for the self antigens. These are antigens which could actually switch on your immune system, all right? And our immune system could actually detect which is which, which is new, which is for here. And with inflammation going up and up, usually it loses that. And these self antigen would be presented, causing your immune system to get confused and react towards the self antigens as well. Uh, the second mechanism would, uh, is what we call molecular mimicry, wherein the antigens of the infectious agents and host cells are pretty much the same or antigenically similar, meaning they will um, attract the same kind of antibodies towards them, and the antibody would not know that it is not um, killing infectious agents, instead the host cell. Right? And with persistent viral infections, um, this could lead to unregulated or misdirected immune responses, and um, which very much commonly happens in persistent infections, which seed into organs. Right? So, body system per body system. Respiratory tract being the most common portal of entry and exit of viruses. Um, how do viruses cause problems in this one? You know, you, we know how they replicate. We know um, how they hijack the mucociliary escalator and such. But let's go into the exact mechanism, all right? So when viruses attack the respiratory epithelium, there would be destruction of these epithelial cells, either by lysis or um, by dying, right? There is local cessation or the cilial activity would stop, right? There is focal loss of mucus layer integrity. And you know that these two um, anatomic characteristics of the respiratory passageway protect the epithelium, right? So um, it's not just the cells that it is affecting, it's also the protective barrier, right? And when this is not um, addressed, there would be progressive infection of, the, um, of more epithelial cells. There would be the development of inflammation, increasing the severity, um, sorry, of increasing severity now with fluid exudation and more uh, migration of the inflammatory cells from the circulation into the tissues. And this uh, fluid exudate, these inflammatory cells should uh, would find a way or find a place to go okay so they would accumulate that includes necrotic cellular debris which would be made up of 
uh, dead neutrophils and slowed off uh, epithelium and they would go into the lumen of affected airway passages that's why you have the phlegm that's why you feel that you have to cough up things right this is the way for your body to remove stuff it doesn't need right and if it can't it would actually lead to airway obstruction which leads to hypoxemia or decreased partial pressure of oxygen and respiratory distress right and when your primary epithelium is um, removed or slowed off by the virus of course um, the respiratory tract is now predisposed to suffer from secondary bacterial infection which are usually repelled by the mucociliary blanket right and there are some viruses which could actually depress the immune mechanism they would for example influenza would uh would depress the cellular expression of the toll like receptors in the lung and they would be less able to quickly recognize and neutralize invading bacteria right so when you combine all that with an environmental factor which causes them to develop or to be more vulnerable to viruses like overcrowding um, those dogs living in shelters um, th that would facilitate concurrent airway infection of multiple viruses and bacteria right and you add immunosuppressive effects that could actually lead to your patient not just succumbing to viral infection but to more uh, immune uh, reaction and bacterial infection which ultimately kills them right for the gastrointestinal tract still uh, the main cons consequence of viral infection for the gi tract would be malabsorption diarrhea right and when we say malabsorption diarrhea we are not just losing fluid we are also losing electrolytes vital for the maintenance of cell functions right but how does this happen right number one when the virus enters okay choice of uh, enterocyte they could go for the ones near the villi they could go once near the crypt and once they destroy these enterocytes there would be a reduction in the absorptive surface leading to malabsorptive diarrhea right another way would be of uh, the method for rotavirus wherein the rotavirus can produce a protein the nsp4 which causes the bowel to secrete more fluid into the lumen and that is what we call intestinal hypersecretion right and the thing is the the enterocytes are easily replaced okay they 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 they're usually so slowed off they so they have a very high regenerative rate um, however when they are destroyed they're usually replaced by immature enterocytes which worsens uh, malabsorption and intestinal hypersecretion and in young animals the replacement uh, the replacement rate of enterocytes is not as high as in older animals right kaya sa mas bata um must fate uh, when young animals suffer from diarrhea is usually fatal right um, because it's not just about losing fluid and electrolyte that leads to dehydration hemoconcentration acidosis hypoglycemia and severe systemic electrolyte disturbances which you might think oh it's just fine it's potassium sodium chloride but those are as important as water right and last mechanism among others of course i'm just summarizing um und undigested lactose from suckled milk if that goes into the large bowel that would actually cause osmotic effect and we know that the large bowel is for um we call this secretion uh sorry for um water absorption so if there is an osmotic uh if there's a something there that actually causes osmotic effect that could actually attract the water and cause malabsorption diarrhea now um viral um proliferation in the gi tract activates your adaptive immune response right this causes the production of uh, mucosal iga and systemic igg right which makes them resistant to reinfection because those are your memory cells and when you encounter uh for example parvo again okay kaya kang sinasabi diba 
once you are a survivor of that, you cannot suffer from it again. The thing is, yeah, you can suffer from it. Uh, you can get infected, but maybe your immune system is strong enough and could remember the past infection that you might not even see the signs, but the patient got infected. Right? So when you say, no, it wouldn't be infected again, it's quite a misnomer because they can get infected. The virus can get into the cells and replicate, but they can be easily managed by the immune system because you have the antibodies already. All right? So central nervous system, um, as we may know, as we have discussed as well, um, the central nervous system would have a lot of barriers that um, guard the brain, the spinal cord, the entire CNS and um, neuroinvasiveness would be the virus's ability to overcome these barriers, right? So how would they do this? The virus may reach the brain via the blood vasculature. It can cross the BBB or the blood cerebrospinal fluid barrier. And you have discussed what is it uh, made up, made out of, right? So basically, if the virus can cross these barriers, they can infect the epithelial cells directly beneath it, or they can actually go into the CSF and spread more into the CNS, and um, that would cause more problems. All right. So again, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> neurons. Viruses can also be spread. Uh, by sorry can get into the CNS through the nerves as we have discussed so it's just about how neuroinvasive a virus is to be able to get through these barriers we also discussed the Trojan horse barrier I hope you still remember that all right so neuroinvasiveness is different from neurovirulence right? neurovirulence would be the ability to spread and cause progressive infection of the neurons so but sinabing neuroinvasive, okay, there's a high neuroinvasiveness of a virus. It doesn't mean that it is also neurovirulent, right? Because some, right, some viruses cannot go in, meaning they have a low neuroinvasiveness. But once they're in, they're very neurovirulent. All right. Examples of that be your uh like your rabies virus, the Zika, um, and what I'm gonna discuss later. <laughs> All right. So how do um, CNS infection progress? All right. They can cause neuronal necrosis. Um, neurons can be phagocytosis, which is what we call neuronophagia. Um, perivascular coughing is a pathological finding in, a, in um, brain tissue. I don't know if you, I hope you'll be able to do that. Path two systemic patho, you'll be able to find perivascular coughing. We're in um, the inflammatory cells have infiltrated the perivascular space or the space around the blood vessels, right? Because they're not supposed to go get out, diba? Right? <laughs> they're not supposed to get out. So usually the perivascular coughing would be a sign of inflammation in the brain, right? And among others, um, neuronal necrosis can be signified by uh, what we call red neurons, meaning they are degenerating neurons. Um, it's because the nissle substance inside the cell has actually escaped which causes it to stain eosinophic, eosinophilically? Eh, eosinophilic. Damn. All right. So, for example, a, re a rabies virus is non-cytosidal. It's not going to um, kill the cell. It will keep on, you know, staying there. And again, this is a dead-end uh, site of replication. It causes little inflammatory action, but it is lethal for most mammals. Um, the canine distemper virus causes progressive demyelination. That's why you see incoordination, seizures in these animals. Um, mad cow disease, which is not caused by a virus, but of prions. The other name for this disease is bovine spongiform encephalopathy. I don't even know why I'm speaking so fast. I don't know. Maybe I'm sleepy. I do that when I'm sleepy. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Uh, if you need to pause, you know, I do that. Um, I've been told that I speak too fast. And I think I'm speaking a little bit faster for this lecture. Maybe I just want to be done because I want to watch something in Netflix. Don't repeat that. <laughs> we cope. We cope in different ways, guys. All right. Zika attacks synapses. That's why uh, cognition, memory, and motor deficits are very much 
um, indica um, indicators for um, clinical manifestations of Zika, right? So another system would be the hematopoietic system. Um, the hematopoietic system would be your reticuloendothelial system and your lymphatic system, basically bone marrows, uh, tonsils, thymus, uh, lymph nodes, of course. Okay, so examples of viruses which attack this system would be African horse sickness, blue tongue, yellow fever, equine encephalitis. You can include dengue here as well. All right, so these viruses would have a cell tropism for mononuclear phagocytes. And when they attack these um, phagocytes, right, um, that will cause inhibition of the innate and adaptive immune response. Oh, uh, also included in the hematopoietic system would be uh, the spleen, right? The, the lymphoid tissues in the intestinal system. I think I forgot. I forgot to say that, right? So what else? Um, when they invade these mononuclear phagocytes, they could travel to the lymphoid tissues, wherein they could cause cytolysis of lymphocytes and further immune dysfunction. And when the immune system is down, more infections can come in. Right? And this is very particular for this virus, infectious bursal disease virus, which um, causes infection of the cloacal bursa in chickens. And as you may know, cloacal bursa in chickens, or what we call bursa of Fabricius, is the site of B cell differentiation in birds. So the virus causes the bursa to atrophy, which leads to a severe deficiency in B lymphocytes. And this renders the bird incapable of developing any form of antibody-mediated immune response to other infectious agents because basically there are no B lymphocytes to produce antibodies, right? Um, the immunodeficiency virus, which could affect multiple uh, species like humans, uh, cattle, cats, uh, monkeys, all right? Ibahin mo lang yung simula. It's human immunodeficiency virus, simian immunodeficiency virus, bovine immunodeficiency virus, and feline immunodeficiency virus. They all work the same way. They attack, uh, infect, and destroy specific but different cells of the immune system. We are uh, going to discuss all of these when we go into retroviruses as to what specific cell they attack. HIV would affect CD4, uh, sorry, T helper cells, which express CD4. Cats would be different, cattle would be different, okay? And um, viruses causing systemic infections could ultimately lead to immunosuppression and can also lead to reactivation, right? So there's a lot of mechanism, mechanisms that viruses can utilize to ultimately um, uh, let itself replicate and cause clinical disease. But it's about the balance of it all because they have to replicate, and they have to maintain a number of viable cells for them to replicate. Because if they kill the host, sila talo. Right? Um, lastly, lastly, yes, uh, the virus infection of the host, uh, sorry, of the fetus, is a very common um, sequelae of virus infection. And what is, the fr what, is, what is something that protects the fetus while inside the dam? That would be the placenta. It's a very good barrier, very selective, which protects the fetus from any infection that the dam can contract. However, again, viruses are very smart. They can find a way to cross this barrier. And the table for that is in the book that is in the Google Drive. But I've also included the table here in this PowerPoint, but it might be too small. That's why I'm directing you to the book. Kasi baka maliit pag tinignan dito sa PDF ng PowerPoint. Alright? And um, virus infection outcome depends on the following. Okay? Number one, a virulence and tropism of the infecting virus. Okay? Of course, it's the first thing that determines the outcome. How virulent it is and if it can actually affect a certain body part. How important that body part is. Okay? Gestational age of the fetus would also come into play. Um, those in early gestation period would tend to suffer from fetal death, resorption, or abortion as compared to those which encounters the fetus at late term. The source of the progesterone 
which maintains the pregnancy for these uh, feet, uh, fetuses. <laughs> okay, also matters if um, uh, animal species is dependent on the progesterone produced by the fetus, which is in the case of the sheep. Um, they're more prone to suffer from uh, virus infection and lead to a bad outcome as compared to those animals which rely on the maternal progesterone, which is in the case of pigs. Right? Uh, teratogenic viruses would be those viruses which can cause developmental defects after in utero infection. And the outcome of these infections is greatly influenced by gestational age. Um, if they encounter the fetus at a certain stage of organogenesis and uh, the degree of biological barriers which have formed in the fetus already, such as the CNS or a part of the skin, right? And the degree of immune competence, of course. What else do we need to say? All right. Um, the stage of immuno, uh, immunocompetence development, again, if the virus uh, nasaktuhan niya, na, na, na nagde-develop pa yung immune system, yung malaking part ng immune system ng fetus, then uh, it may not kill the, the fetus before it's born. But when it's born, it is very weak and there is a persistent postnatal infection, which is the case for uh, bovine viral diarrhea virus in cattle and many more. All right. So this is the table for um, those viruses which can actually enter the placenta. So uh, I will cap off this lecture video here before we reach one hour. <laughs> All right. Thank you for joining me here. This caps off the coverage for the first lecture exam. And I will start discussing specific DNA virus families starting next week. We have to start with Pox Viridae. All right. I'll see you then. Thank you and have a good week.